Hello and welcome to the beautiful campus of Newbold College in Berkshire, England. Founded in 1901, it was in 1946 that the college moved to this stunning location with its historic garden and new Tudor mansion. The original owner made his money in 19th century China. Thus, it is fitting that today's students in business, theology, humanities and English actually come from 60 different nationalities to gather to study on this campus. Let's head to the award-winning Grassroof Church for a series of lectures conducted by Dr. Chris Blake. Chris Blake is a professor in English Literature and Communication from Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. He is here giving a lecture over the topic, Searching for a God to Love. Today's topic, Suffering, why so much? All is not right with the world. Something has gone wrong. We see it shuffling on street corners in the afternoon heat. We hear it in a siren's whoop at 3 a.m. We feel it slap us in a name. Nagasaki, Oklahoma City. Pompeii, Chernobyl, Twin Towers, Jonestown, My Lai, Rwanda, Auschwitz. It claws at our minds from the inside. A monstrous dread standing between us and ever falling in love with God. It leads to a question each of us grapples with or should. Why so much suffering? If we're human, we're touched by suffering, seared, hounded, devastated, trip, crippled, suffocated. Headlines shout murder and fiery deaths behind every running sore of war on the planet. Lurk untold tortures and mind-numbing rapes. Last night we talked about the time of trouble for many people on the planet. That time has passed. They have endured their time of trouble. It will never get worse for them. I cannot get my mind around the fact that every 60 seconds, 33 children on this planet starve to death. Every minute, 33 children. If you haven't been slapped by suffering, you haven't lived long enough. In the summer of 1969, humans first walked on the moon, a crowing achievement for our race. But now, 50 years later, we cannot stop poverty and sexual abuse here on this planet. Nothing has quelled bigotry. All the genius of humankind is weaker than the instinct of human selfishness. Mark Twain growls, man is the only animal that blushes or needs to. Carl Jung wrote, the chief and only thing wrong with the world is man. And yet we know that the claw hand of suffering moves past man's reach. Tornadoes, cyclones, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes wreak havoc, battering the belief or at least the love out of many. Nature is a tough book to read. Tonight we're going to be looking at the tough questions and not dodging them because they are tough. Most believing unbelievers cite the world's suffering as their number one obstacle to believing in a loving, compassionate God. They cannot find a God to love. It's the reason millions of sensitive people give up altogether on God. They ask, why doesn't God stop the suffering and the endless hurting? To do so makes such glorious good sense. Back around 300 B.C., Epicurus posed an ancient dilemma. Either God can stop suffering and will not, 
in which case he is evil, or God wants to but cannot, in which case he is impotent. Would he in either case deserve our worship? In his play, J.B., Archibald MacLeish says, If God is God, he is not good. If God is good, he is not God. William Blake inquires of the snarling tiger, Did he who made the lamb make thee? If we are ever to fully love God, we cannot look away from suffering, excusing conditions as being not that bad. We know differently. Instead, we must look at suffering unblinking to discover truths. The truth is, before the beginning of earth dawned, the genesis of suffering. In the concluding book of the Bible, Revelation, the story unfolds in chapter 12, Verses 7 to 9. What Adventists call the great controversy. Here's what's written there in chapter 12. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they were defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Now in Phoenician and Egyptian literature, Greek and Roman mythology, the Gilgamesh epic and the Rig Vita, all creation accounts, no account of any of them portrays the inception of evil as definitively as does the Bible. It wasn't a war of laser swords, a la Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. It was a war of concepts, a battle for minds and affections, the battle for the trusting love of all inhabitants in the universe. And Lucifer was thrown down. In reality, suffering and sin are synonyms. This conflict does not involve an offended deity defending his dignity. No. This is about a loving God defending reality. Reality is where God lives. Dick Wynn writes, the central core of the great controversy is Satan's deceptive accusations about the character of God. Because those who accept Satan's portrayal of God will turn from God. They will break faith with the life giver. And thus, they will die. Our Father, therefore, has one overriding goal, to reveal himself as he really is. So what are the charges of this dragon? Well, they remain today. God is against freedom. You can only find freedom if you're not serving God. God is against personal expression. We all need to worship the same way and sing the same way and breathe the same way. God is anti-fun. God is power hungry. God's subjects serve him out of greed and or fear. God is unforgiving, arbitrary, he will torture you if you don't agree with him, and God cannot be trusted. When Lucifer arrived on earth, he became Satan in charge of this unseen world. There is a reality beyond what we can see. Revelation 12, 4 reports, his tail swept down a third of the stars. We read that often as the angels, that a third of the angels were lost. To every parent who is suffering because their child has wandered, 
and are laboring under the misconception that it must inevitably be their fault. I would point them to the Father God who lost a third of his children. The Bible depicts these fallen beings as our most formidable enemies. Now we might ask, why didn't God squash Lucifer like a fly? All of this that's going on would not have happened. The downside, of course, to that approach is that certainly at the beginning, rubbing out the lone dissenter would not have endeared God to a watching universe. All would have served God thereafter, not out of love, but out of fear. And God knows love cannot be forced. Evil is a mystery. Sometimes I ask people, what if Satan and all his legions died today? Do you think tomorrow all suffering on this planet would stop? Most people say no. In fact, I'm looking in the audience and there are some of you who sadly sh are shaking your heads no. Human evil would still exist. We are wound up with it. We would still be free to cause distrust and pain. To stop the hurt, we must be radically changed from the inside. All of the charges aimed at God, of course, can be truthfully applied to the dragon. The legendary mark of the beast symbolically placed on the hand and on the forehead in Revelation, chapters 13 and 17, are characterized by force, coercion, the hand, and by lies, deception. Ellen White observes, the kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of force. Every individual regards every other as an obstacle in the way of his own advancement. Have you ever been in that sort of situation? or a stepping stone on which he himself may climb to a higher place. There can be no more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy those who do not appreciate our work or who act contrary to our ideas. No more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of the evil one. We are on the side of the beast, no matter how noble our aims, when we use coercion and deception. Many years ago, a Danish atheist, Yolanda and I met, with the unlikely name of Christian Fogg, and I understand in Denmark it's not pronounced Fogg, but I happen to like Christian Fogg, so I'm going to say it that way. Christian Fogg showed up and heard a sermon of mine just off the street, wandered into a Seventh-day Adventist church, and he wrote me a letter, and on the back of the letter he signed it Christian Fogg, and I thought it was a commentary about my sermon. <laughs> but he said, I haven't heard these ideas from any church. I would like to talk with you more about them. So we invited him over to our house and we had a delightful supper. Afterward, we sat on the sofa and talked deep talk. You know how that can happen sometimes? He asked me this question. Why is it that your God won't stop suffering? Even an earthly father keeps his children from hurting each other. I'm going to pause here. How would you answer him? I sent up a quick prayer, and this is what came out. I said, what do you think causes the most suffering in the world? Is it our words or our weapons? He thought for a moment, he said, our words, those that are spoken, and those that are unspoken. I agreed with them. So, 
For God to keep us from hurting each other, he would have to control our words. And to control our words, he would have to control our thoughts. We fight world wars, wars to prevent such oppression. You were alive, I said to him, when a man named Hitler wanted to control people's thoughts. How would you like a God like that? He stared at me wide-eyed. I see what you mean, he said. Yes, I would rather be free. Years ago, I attended a funeral of a two-year-old son of a good friend of mine. My friend had found his son floating face down in a pond. I was on the platform at that funeral service and I remember looking at the coffin and thinking, it's much too small. I looked out over a sea of tears. It was one of the saddest funerals I've ever attended. The pastor presiding at that funeral leaned on the pulpit, looked out over this audience and said, we must recognize that whatever happens is God's will. And when I heard those words, I wanted to stand up and shout, No! This is not God's will. I still believe that. Not my God. Decorum pinned me in my seat that dreary day. You see, we need to distinguish first about between what God allows and what God desires. Many think of God's will as equivalent to God's desire, his want. But we also know that in the Bible it says it is not God's desire that any should perish. There are going to be people who perish, apparently. Beyond God's desire. One sunny morning, my son Jeffrey was five years old. We were eating bowls of Cheerios. How many of you know Cheerios? Okay. Sounds like a good British uh, cereal to me, actually. Cheerios. <laughs> And we were discussing why Jeffrey could not go over to his friend Clayton's house to play. I said, I'm sorry, Jeff, you can't go. And Jeff looked down, suddenly growing pensive. And then he looked at me intently with his five-year-old philosopher's eyes and said, Dad, God doesn't get his way all the time either, does he? I sat stunned, my eyes misted over a little bit, and I said, no, Jeff, he doesn't. You know, when I hear people talk about God is in control of everything, I get nervous. Because if indeed it is God's desire that those 33 children are starving to death this minute, I don't think I can love that God. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of sensitive, thoughtful people have the same question. So what do we do with this? Where do we go? The all-powerful, all-knowing master of the universe does not get his way because his way is also the way of freedom. I mentioned this before. Freedom is sacred to God. God would rather have us free than have us safe. God would rather have us free than have us saved. We know this because otherwise God would force us to be saved. And he will not do that. He would force us to be gentle, to be unselfish, 
to be kind. But God understands that sullen submission breeds resentment and rebellion. God knows love cannot be forced. We can compare God's situation to my family's purchase of our present house. Yolanda and I bought a house, and we bought this house so it would be a center for our family of light and warmth and energy and peace and hope and love. But with the house, we also purchased something else, a mortgage. The bank actually owns our house, even though we bought it. It's in our name. We must make payments to the bank. I'm not alone in this. In buying the house, we also bought a life of perpetual poverty. The house, oh, let me make something very clear. It is not our desire to make those payments. Are we all clear? <laughs> the payments, though, come with the house. For God, the mortgage payments of freedom right now in this life amount to suffering. They come with the house. The house God has bought is human free will. For now, the prince of darkness is the bank. Jesus calls him the ruler of this world, yet adds, don't be afraid, for I have overcome the world. One night, Yolanda and I stood in the kitchen in Hagerstown, Maryland, mesmerized by a spectacular lightning storm. Earlier, earlier that day, the Weather Channel's forecaster had pointed to our town on a map and announced cheerfully, look at this, folks, look at Hagerstown, Maryland. They're about to be crushed. All at once, a deafening clap sounded and sizzling raced through the house. Instinctively, I said, whoa! <coughs> Threw her back from the window. Maybe it was a more manly one. Whoa! That sounds a little better. <laughs> I think it was more like the former, frankly. <laughs> Upon an inspection afterward, we found that one light bulb, the television and the VCR were gone. We had been hit by a thunderbolt. The next day I called the store where I had purchased the television. Our service contract was still in effect, but the representative coolly informed me that lightning strikes are not covered by the contract. Because, you know the answer, they are an act of God. I paused on the line, hovering like a hummingbird. I said, he gets blamed for a lot of things, doesn't he? Yes, sir, he does, she said. Understandably, we become confused when Christians pray, thank you, God, for this nice day or for the sunshine or the needed rain. We're saying that God controls the weather. He's also then apparently in charge of flooding in the Midwestern United States, Bay of Bengal typhoons that maroon hundreds of thousands of people, droughts in Eastern Africa that starve millions, and killer quakes in China. We have to accept both sides. It's hard to love a God who controls all that. Is it merely a matter of our unfortunate positioning? Much like a grain of sand is beautiful until it gets in your eye. 
When I read the newspaper accounts of tragedies where some are killed and some are spared, and a tearful survivor says, God saved my family. Mm. I think about the people who lost loved ones. What do the grieving think of God when they read those words? The message appears obvious and terrible. If God saved theirs, he killed mine. God didn't want my loved ones saved. Even when God is praised, he often indirectly takes the blame. I wonder how much of a favor we're doing him when we make such pronouncements. I do believe sometimes I've been spared from immense tragedy. And on those occasions, I do share that with close loved ones especially. But I don't go out and announce it if others have lost loved ones. If you've ever asked for anything three times, as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he really did not want to go through with it. We are saved by one word, nevertheless. Nevertheless. At the foot of the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's where virtually all my questions about suffering are answered. Because I wonder, what is God willing to give up for me? You look at the cross... And you see Jesus groaning and twitching. And you realize with me that we are not abandoned. That God understands. Do we love God only when life is dripping smooth and sweet? The inescapable question is, do we love freedom or not? Are we willing as countless soldiers have been, and as God is, to give up everything for freedom's sake. The rap against religion is that it's too restrictive, too cramping, but we have no idea of the immensity of freedom. Terrors and tortures are never God's desire. Our long human howl will end with singing the song of the Lamb of God and His paramount plan will put an end to evil. Well, you see, God will buy back the bank. For the sake of my freedom, God invests so much and is so troubled. When I look at the world's suffering, I understand a little bit why God endures it. And I love him all the more. The themes and topics explored in this series are from Chris Blake's book, Searching for a God to Love. For more information on how to get your copy, please visit searchingforagodtolove.org.uk.